Whoever dwells in the shadow of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, God is my strength and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. God will cover you with his feathers, and under God's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. This is DisciplesNet. We thank you so much for joining us. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. today as I come before God in prayer so that we may all be in prayer together. Holy God, as we come before you today, we have all been far away from you at times this week. We have done things that are not consistent with your will for your children. We are sorry for the wrongs we have done and the right things we have not done. Knowing that you are a loving parent, filled with a grace that is beyond our ability to understand. We ask that you now forgive our shortcomings and sins. Thank you for welcoming us back to your paths, even when we stumble and sometimes fail. We offer our worship to you as the secure presence in all our times of trouble. It is in this knowledge that we find the courage to hope for better things in an uncertain and broken world. We ask now that you especially bring that hope to those of us who are suffering. Be with our sisters and brothers who flee war-torn areas, who are unable to protect their children from danger or find food to nourish them. Help them find a promise of better times to come when they will see their country find peace, flourish, and be able to provide security and a fruitful living for them. For those who are ill, bring the gift of healing. Where no healing of the body is possible, ease their pain and give them a hope of a place in your kingdom where they will leave their failing bodies behind and enter into the joy of your salvation. For your children who suffer from oppression and discrimination because of their skin color or their beliefs, 
or their station in life. We ask that you bring them courage to stand up to those who treat them poorly and that they have a hope for a world where such things are not done. But we ask further that you enter the hearts of those who do not understand that all of us on this planet are your children. Teach them to see everyone as their brothers and sisters, beloved of you and worthy of their respect. Most of all, we give you our gratitude that you offer us the vision of your kingdom coming here on earth, where there is enough for all, where no one goes without, where no child is afraid of mistreatment, where each of us reaches out to assure that all share in the blessings you send. For that hope that we can be better than we are, we bless you and praise you as our sure presence, strong beyond measure and yet always near, gentle and giving us grace upon grace. We offer our prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the As we travel through the desert, storms beset us by the way. But beyond the river Jordan lies a field of endless day. Farther on, still go farther, count the milestones one by one. Jesus will forsake you never, it is better farther on. Oh, my brother, are you weary from the roughness of the way? Does your strength begin to fail you and your vigor to Farther on, still go farther, count the milestones one by one. Jesus will forsake you never, it is better farther on. At my grave, oh, still be singing, though you weep for one that's gone sing it as we once did sing it it is better farther on farther on still go farther count the milestones one by one jesus will forsake you never it is better farther on. It is better farther on. Reading from Jeremiah 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadrezzar. At that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then 
my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, By my field that is at Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, seventeen shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Masiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. May God add his blessing to our hearing and understanding of this word. Amen. I want to preach to you today, but I also want to talk to you just a little bit about preaching as I do that. Sometimes it is easy to preach a sermon with a simple devotional message. Sometimes it is easy to preach a sermon with a message that makes a demand upon people for something that the preacher wants you to do in your life. Sometimes the sermon needs to include a little bit of Bible study in order to make us understand where we are going with the text. And so we've got some of all of that today, and I'm going to begin with just a little bit of Bible study and church history before getting into the other part of the sermon. We have a story in today's scripture about Jeremiah the prophet in the nation of Judah buying a piece of property from Hanamel, who is actually his cousin. He's someone in Jeremiah's family. And the situation historically is this. The year is 587 BC, or before the Common Era. The nation of Israel is long since gone. Jeremiah has been predicting for 40 years that his nation, the nation of Judah, is going to be conquered and destroyed. And the agent of that will be the Babylonians. And if you read the text, you see Babylonians and Chaldeans, and those are two words for the same group of people. The king of the Babylonians is Nebuchadnezzar. And this army is literally at the city wall in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about to fall. And the king Zedekiah is about to be captured and taken hostage or carried away into slavery. Because Jeremiah has been hostile to the king and has preached this message that destruction will come for all of this time, Jeremiah himself is actually in prison at the time of this particular story. That's enough history for the moment. What we have now is everything that Jeremiah has said it looks like it's about to come true. Everybody else now finally believes what Jeremiah said all along. This does not make Jeremiah more popular, believe me. But the wolf is at the door, if you will. Everyone now knows that the nation is about to be conquered. And what does Jeremiah do? All of a sudden, Jeremiah does a 180-degree turn. He does what politicians accuse each other today of a flip-flop. He does a complete flip-flop, and he starts preaching a message, not of doom and destruction. He starts preaching a message of hope. He starts preaching a message of hope. And he wants to show that 
message of hope. He wants to bear witness to that message of hope by, if you will, putting his money where his mouth is. And he makes arrangements to purchase a field from his cousin. Now think about this for a moment. Everybody thinks Jeremiah is crazy. Hamamel sees an opportunity to unload a field that is totally worthless because the Babylonians are going to conquer the city in a matter of weeks or maybe even days, and he's still going to get 17 shekels of silver that he can take somewhere else. Good deal for him. Crazy for Jeremiah. Hamamel probably was drawn into this precisely because he thought Jeremiah was crazy. Who would purchase a field in a city that is about to be overrun by the enemy? The description of purchasing this field. Now we're back to the Bible study part for a minute. The picture of Jeremiah purchasing this field is detailed in verses 9 through 13 of our reading today. And I am told, I haven't done all of this research myself, but I am told that that is the most detailed description of the purchase of a piece of property that we have in all of Scripture. It goes through the the whole thing about how it is recorded, uh, how it is paid for, how the negotiations went. And then Jeremiah says, take copies of this deed and put them in a secure place so that we can find them later. That's not the exact language of Scripture, but so that we can find them later because Jeremiah is insisting that there is hope in this situation. He says, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. He insists that God is going to make it possible for the people of Judah to come back to Jerusalem at some time in the future. No guarantees about when, but the idea is that he not only gives a message of hope and of comfort, but he also exhibits how committed he is to that testimony. He bears witness to his own prophecy by spending his hard-earned money. The message is one of hope. It is a message of comfort. And I would suggest that it is a message for us today. My own way of looking at the world is sometimes a little pessimistic. I have a tendency toward despair and doom. I worry about food for people all over the world. I worry about clean air and water for people all over the world. I worry about energy. I worry about the economy. I worry about how people react in a selfish way when they are threatened in any way whatsoever. And we're not very good about sharing the goodies. There is corruption. There's lack of leadership. There's greed. Uh, in politics, in business, in leadership of nations. Uh, Sometimes there is lack of vision and courage. Somebody make him stop. Please make him stop. Maybe you don't need to hear all of my list of things that upset me about the world. But I know that I need to hear the message that Jeremiah brings. The message of Jeremiah reaches me not so much when he is condemning everything that's going on in the world. I think I can see that for myself. I don't need Jeremiah to tell me that. But when he affirms with a verbal message, and then he bears witness to that same affirmation with deeds and with money, that God is still in charge, despite what we think we are seeing, God's plan, too long range for us to appreciate, perhaps, but God's plan will not be ultimately thwarted or frustrated. When Jeremiah says those things and bears witness to those things with his deeds, 
and with his money. That means something to me, and it brings hope. Well, going back to talking about preaching, we've just about come to the point now where I've kind of made my point, and you may be saying, so all right, preacher, what is it that you really want me to do? What am I suggesting that we do? Well, I know that I need the strength of Jeremiah's example to stand up and to affirm myself. I think I, I think all of us really, are called to speak, to spend money, to invest in the future, if you will, in a way which advocates and advances hope. If my limited vision seems weak, then I need that example of the courage and the hope of someone like Jeremiah, touching me at a point of deep need, giving me courage to, as I say, invest time, hope, maybe even money in the future, in faith that my own tiny contribution will somehow really be part of God's plan. To affirm the faith in God as sovereign Lord. To affirm, to testify to the message of Jeremiah that we have great and marvelous hope despite the forces of death which surround us. An example of this from our own lives 15 years ago, it was in September of 2001, immediately after American Airlines planes had been hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center, that my wife and I decided that something we were going to do with a little bit of money was purchase stock in American Airlines. We didn't make any money doing that. We didn't expect to. And we didn't put a whole lot of money into it either. But we did what we thought we wanted to do with a little bit of our own money to express our belief that there is hope in the future and that God is still in charge. The reading stopped at verse 15. But if you go just a little farther, you see Jeremiah offering prayer to God and saying, nothing is too difficult for you. In the words of some modern Christian music, our God is an awesome God. And our hope comes from the fact that that awesome God, nothing is too difficult. And that means that we have hope. Amen.
when the Babylonians had surrounded the city of Jerusalem and the Judeans were sure of their defeat, Jeremiah brought a message of hope. When we feel surrounded by our sorrow and our fears, when we are sure that our troubles will defeat us, we can come to this table for a renewed hope. For at this table, we meet a God for whom all things are possible. And when we take of this bread and drink of this cup, we can be restored. Our hope can come alive again. Please pray with me. God, thank you for this, your blessing of your bread and cup. And thank you that we have a table of hope where we may always be welcome to be restored. When we come here, we remember that on the last night that Jesus had with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is my life poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, remember me. For it is as long as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup that you remember the Lord's life, death, and his resurrection. Please come to the table. In faith that our God is so great that nothing is too difficult. In hope that you and I can have a small part in advancing the plan of that God whom we love. Let us depart and reach out in love to one another. Amen.